which kind of person are you? Uh, cause there's a lot of kind of persons in your domain. Like there's psychotherapists, psychoanalysts, psychiatrists, psychologists. I'm, I'm a lot of the above. Oh, okay. Um, so the psychotherapist is, is kind of like the generic term. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a psychotherapist. I'm also a licensed clinical psychologist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm also a psychoanalyst. Oh. <laughs> Those are all different things. But you combine them like a Power Ranger of psychodynamic. <laughs> I've got insight. a whole bunch of superpowers. <laughs> right on. Okay. Cool. Because you have a voice like somebody who does what I do, but in a professional setting. <laughs> I have that comforting, calm sort of voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just emanating confidence and right. acceptance and intimacy. I've been really looking forward to this interview just because I feel like you, you're going to give me room to say a lot Ooh. of stuff that I want to say. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm the guy with the rope. And you just run with it, do whatever you want, all kind of nuts that you, you want. You got the rope, go ahead, hang yourself with there it. There you go. <laughs> or save yourself and I'll pull you back in, you know? All right. Yeah. So um, I guess uh, this is a kind of a lame question, but where did you come across me and what domain? How did I ping your radar? It, it happened when I, when I started thinking that I wanted to work in the gender space again. I had kind of been hibernating for a long time, staying away from it. And then I just started researching about detransition. Um, and one of the first things I came across was a listing for some of your, you know, interviews with detransitioners. And then I went through, I did a deep dive and I listened to a lot of them because I was taking down quotes and using a bunch of quotes from them for an article I was writing. Um, and somewhere in the midst of all that, I listened to the interview you did with Sasha. And I reached out to Sasha and asked her about supervision. And she said, no, but join Geta the Gender Exploratory Therapy Association. We founded that, just founded that. It's right at the beginning. So I joined that. And then there was D-Trans Awareness Day, and I reached out to Stella, and we connected. And yeah, so you're, you're, the, you're patient zero. It all starts with oh, you. Oh, great. That's what I want to be. I want to be the <laughs> I want to be ground zero for this. <laughs> you are. Actually, you are. I, I, I have no desire in that direction. But you said that you were asking Sasha for supervision or what, what Well, you, you know, in in the early days when, you know, they were the Sasha and Stella are like the authorities on working with gender dysphoric youth and I thought, yeah. well, I probably need some help. I oh. need some you know, some expertise or guidance. You know, I've been working for decades, but I was under the assumption, I think the mistaken assumption that a lot of people are under these days, that you need some special skill set to work with gender dysphoria. And that's just, that's just buying into the whole idea that this is something exceptional and we need to treat it differently. I think that's wrong. You just need to apply generally accepted psychotherapeutic practices and work with people like anybody else. Um, I realized that after I started doing it pretty quickly. Yeah. And you said that you had taken a break from gender. So you were involved in a previous gender crush? Or well, or you know, I've had, I've had gender issues throughout my practice. And one of my first cases, one of my very first cases, someone I saw for years and years, was, was a, a young woman who insisted she was born in the wrong body and very masculine identified. I, and I learned so much about what is behind that kind of cross-gender identification in a time when I didn't have to worry about, you know, gender ideology. There wasn't going to be anybody coming after me telling me I was a transphobe. I just had free inquiry. So I learned, I cut my teeth really on that. And then I've had, you know, gender issues come up a lot. I've had men who envy women and wish they had been born women. I've had vice versa. I think there's, there's a lot of that going around. I think we often have the mistaken belief that the other gender has it better than we do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I had, I had worked with those issues throughout my career. Um, and I, as I, as I think you might know, I, I have a, um, 
a trans identified child uh, who I tangled with the whole mental health profession and medical establishment early on, like 10 years ago. And um, that experience, I just went into a cave after that. You know, it was really hard being demonized by um, psychotherapists because I thought that there were some compelling psychological reasons why my daughter might want to transition that needed to be looked at. You know, I was, you know, I was insulted by the medical, the endocrinologist. I mean, it's just like it was a bad experience. So I just sort of went away believing for a long time that that was that was the the standard of treatment now that that's what everybody did and that nobody worked the way I did anymore. Huh. Um, and then I kind of came out of it, you know, after a while, you know, it's also just sort of hurt, wounded, self protective, I just went away. Yeah. Well, uh, did you cease uh, psychotherapizing? Or did you practice? No, that just No, I had a more general practice, though. Okay. You know, I've always had a general practice, but but um, I just wasn't out pursuing that area. I wasn't challenging anything. Um, I was also um, I live in Palm Springs, which is a um, an extremely progressive gay community, and I was on I was an officer and on the board of directors of the local LGBT center. I was very connected to the community, and that center was kind of all in on gender ideology. So I was keeping my head down. These were my friends. I didn't want to make waves um, mm. until I couldn't do that anymore. So there were reasons why I was silent for a long time. Why do you think gender is so powerful as a concept, as a contagion? Like it's just, it just seems so, it's just so captivating. People just love it. They love hating it too. They love being against it too. It's just kind of gravitational pull to it i think i think there's lots of compelling explanations out there the one with, that you know and that i i accept is that there is a kind of pseudo religious quality to it that's replacing the absence of spirituality in contemporary life i think that's a big part of it um in the i also think that it's a very compelling solution to offer adolescent kids um, who are adrift, trying to form a sense of identity, um, scared of separating from their parents and making their way as adults in the world, um, na navigating adulthood. And I think that gender ideology and this idea that you're, you know, you've got this gender spirit and that once you identify it and come out, it's, it's an accomplishment, it's an achievement to be celebrated. And it kind of um, obviates all those other challenges of adulthood. Um, I, I see it in my, both in my adolescents who are pre-transition but wanting to, to transition, and I see it in my detransitioners, that all this stuff about identi identity formation is, is terrifying to them. They don't feel ready. Okay. Is that, uh, are you inclined to think that that's a modern issue or just a perennial issue for that age group and that different societies in different places and times have dealt with that differently or had different tools? Well, the whole, the whole issue of separation, individuation, and identity formation, I, I do think that's a universal thing. And I think that other cultures have rites of passage and rituals that help people move through those things. I think it's particularly bad for our um, generation, you, I know you've read Coddling the American Mind. Um, I think that the, this generation of kids have been so protected and shielded from adversity that they're, they're unprepared for it. They're unprepared for a life of adulthood in which no one will be protecting them anymore. Huh. How does... Okay, so I, I get in... No, I don't get in trouble, but I ruffle feathers on Twitter because I, even though I work in the gender critical space or I have a lot of gender critical contacts and I've platformed a lot of gender critical voices, I still consider myself gender positive. I think that there is a, a way of thinking about gender as an honoring of the roles and the responsibilities that are particular to the men and women that build society. I think that gender as a social 
construct that's constructed out of sex that regulates different behavioral patterns is actually a good thing in that a lot of religions and storytelling and mythologies are maps, mappings of you know, the masculine and the feminine and give boys particular concepts of courage and sacrifice, let's just say, uh, that are particular to boys. Not that girls don't sacrifice and girls don't need courage or m women don't manifest courage and integrity, but they through storytelling, like something like the Odyssey or something, you get these masculine characters that, that are very masculine, that really embody these virtues in a way that, that a boy can see himself in and develop, you know, develop individuation or identity formation through kind of projecting onto a mythological story and then kind of being molded by that story. I'm kind of losing my question, but I still think that gender isn't just simply something that we can discard. I, I totally agree, but you're, you're talking about gender as a social construct, which I totally agree with everything you just said, versus gender as this kind of ineffable spiritual identity you have inside of you yeah. and can know that's unrelated to your biology. They're, they're, like a I spirit mean, I, animal, but it's somehow right. engraved into gender stereotypes and engraved into the flesh rather than I have a bird that's always with me or something like that. Right, right. But, but you know, this whole idea of there being these, these mythic stories or characters that, that you can identify with and can guide you in your process into becoming a male um, you know, those are those are kind of out of favor right now. I mean, all of the traditional masculine virtues are kind of under siege. Um, you know, it's not it's not great to be a man anymore. Um, you should be you should be a woman. Is really you know you should be woman like huh. these days. Uh, well, yeah. I if you look at especially in the last ten years, the media that has come out from our centers of power, like Hollywood, let's just say, it's the men is usually a buffoon or an obstacle to the female character. There's a lot of these strong female characters that are even kind of poorly written because they they can't have any flaws. They're not allowed to have any flaws. They don't get to develop at all. They're already always perfect and all powerful and they just have to overcome the uh, obstructions that are presented to them by society or, or embodied usually by men. So if thinking in terms of that, have you thought about particular two boys, what boys need? or where boys are at, like generally, and this is kind of in stereotypical, uh, like projection area and stuff. But like, if we were to try to help boys in general, like, where will we start? Or how would we begin? We begin by, um, we have to stop pathologizing normal masculine traits and behaviors. Um, you know, the, the, the American Psychological Association came out a few years back with their guidelines. And this, basically, they pathologized masculinity. Um, and, you know, I think that it was a good thing to challenge the patriarchy and Me Too was an important movement. But it's gotten to the point where boys growing up today, they feel bad about being men just by being men. I, I see this in my my kids who want to, my boys who want to transition and the yeah. ones who have detransitioned that they, they look at masculinity as this, they're part of the toxic rape culture and they want to be anything but. Um, so there, there kind of aren't really positive role models for men. And if you claim any, you, you sort of qualified it yourself, I just noticed, if you claim something as a masculine virtue, like courage, someone will say, are you saying women can't have those qualities? I mean, <laughs> like a drop of a hat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's, there's, so there's no place to claim positive masculinity. There isn't. Yeah. Yeah. It's all bad or it's, or it's neutral. Right? Yeah. Why do you think that that gained favor, that view of masculine? Is it, could it be the case? I'm just thinking off the top of my head that we've entered into a stage of affluence and then degeneracy where masculinity, uh, hyper-masculinity is no longer needed and is actually kind of uh, disrupts the calm order of things, the calm, purely social order that no longer has adventure and dragons and stuff like that. Well, it's, it's I, yes, I do think so. Because some things I something I often think, but don't say aloud very often is what we need is 
a land war invasion of the United States. So we can, we can then appreciate some of these traditional masculine values, you know, sacrifice, the willingness of men, you know, to take up arms and possibly sacrifice their lives for their country and their loved ones. That's a really great, positive male thing that's not, not appreciated at all right now. Yeah. Well, I guess we could do it, like send them on, find a new wild West. I guess like, I'm just trying to avoid a situation where murder is kind of (laughs) happening. Like, okay, boys, it's time to go colonize Mars, you know, and whoever wins gets the girl or whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm reading um, Richard Reeves' new book right now about, it's all about how men are falling behind on every scale you look at from women in the United States. And there's like, there, what is there for men to do now that makes them feel good about being men? And I think they need to feel good about being men and not just people. You know, I think that's important. So they're not breadwinners anymore, Right. Um, yeah. all, the ma- all the manufacturing jobs have kind of left for the people who aren't educated, the educated elite. Men are doing fine in a lot of ways, but people yeah, but who are they, had... Are they very masculine? It seems like I'm just looking at our current crop of elite, and we have a lot of bitchy-ass men. Like, if you look at the Twitter files and stuff, the people in charge there, like these kind of pathologically f- f- effeminate... Uh, right men in a, in a in a negative way so it doesn't seem like that unless you have a titan of industry or you're uh you're working purely in the engineering department i like on one level of analysis what elon musk did when he fired 75 percent of twitter he just proposed that everybody who wants to work their asses off gets to stay and that kind of selected mostly males willing right. to sacrifice themselves and being on this cutting edge of technology so is that a positive male virtue, the willingness to work that hard and sacrifice your personal life to succeed? Is that? Is it? <laughs> um, I think it's a positive thing. It can be excessive. You know, men can go too far and yeah. neglect everybody else in their lives. But I think that's a good thing. Huh. Um, and then I, balance I'll, comes I'll, in later as they mature? Or? I think so. Yeah. But early on in their careers, that's a good thing. I spend a lot. I spend part of my life in the real estate world, because I have, I have real estate holdings. I come from a real estate family, so I not, know a lot of men who are bankers, realtors, um, builders. They're, they're kind of, and they're they're sort of traditionally masculine guys, and it's very comforting to me to be around them. Because they're not, they're not troubled by a lot of this stuff that you and I are occupied with in our world. They're just, you know, going around building their careers and being successful and yeah. supporting their families. I'm sure, I don't mean to hold them up as like perfect in any way, but it's just nice to see people going on business as usual. It does exist. Yeah. Well, one um, pattern that I've seen in the early onset gender dysphoria or the, uh, you know, a lot of youth just suddenly being obsessed with gender and then transitioning is that the dads don't really know what to do. It's like the dads are just kind of doing their job and they're like, I don't, I don't understand any of this stuff. And the moms get involved in it. That's why there's kind of a skew towards female representation and trying to sort this stuff out is because moms, uh, well, one is affecting girls and moms don't want the girls to mess with their bodies because the girls don't really understand what their bodies are for yet. And the moms kind of have gone through the birthing process. Um, but the dads just seem like this just doesn't make much sense to them. It, it, it's not practical at all. It, it's not something you do. It's not something you build. It's something you obsess over and then do to yourself, I guess. So one of the things that I've noted is that is this the erosion of the concept of, of authority in mm. everywhere, including in the family and the father as, as an authoritative figure who sets certain rules? Sure. Um, I mean, sometimes when I consult with parents um, about their kids, I want to say to them, well, why don't you just tell them no and that they're living under your roof and they have to abide by your rules. And if they would like to be emancipated so they don't have to follow the rules, you'd be glad to help them along. I think that's terrible advice, but I I often want to give it because I feel like 
I've, especially fathers, they, their, their authority has been totally eroded. And now there's this whole gender ideology community out there ready to step in and, and replace the parents, yeah. you know, as the sources of guidance. Yeah. So yeah. I, I also see, though, with a, a lot of my um, D-trans boys, men, that they're, the fathers are pretty unreliable to cat catastrophic father figures. Yeah. You know, they don't have any place to identify with a positive male figure. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen that too. Mm -hmm. Daddy issues. Daddy issues. They even catch up with boys. It's, it's, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't have a vast population, but it's pretty much universal in my experience. There isn't one good father son relationship I've seen. Oh, no. Huh. Yeah. Not one. Oh. So I, I work with, uh, I work with kids. I, I transport sentient cargo with low self-control, <laughs> right? Or low ability of self-control. And uh, in order for this uh, to happen safely, I do have to be authoritative. And especially this year, because we have a lot of really young kids and they need to sit down and not roughhouse and throw their water bottles at the back of my head. Right. Um, right. I need to have very strict rules and I have to hammer it into them. And so I do have to raise my voice and I have to project power. Um, kind of right. like, like edging on scary, but you know, it, to a certain extent, like shocking and, and definitive and you will not do this. And I, as I've done this, I've adapted myself to not, investing my emotion into that, not feeling bad, not like using my emotion to that, just kind of using my force to say, this is what we're going to do. And then being very kind of organizing things more and more militarily. I'm, I'm watching my, my persona in this role become more of a drill sergeant, more of like, we, like very order, very clean, very, like very impactful, um, uh, no hard feelings, but if you, if you, if you step up, I'm going to call you out. If you, you know, if you switch your seats while I'm on the busy road, I'm going to call you out over and over and over and over and over again, and then try to give them love and, and, uh, wit, you know, when things aren't that way or uh, aren't, aren't in a tense situation. So I, I bring that because, uh, the loss of male authority through whatever means needs to be regained. And it's kind of not an easy thing to be an authority, authority figure because you are kind of oppressive and you have to, there's an art to it, to, to saying no. And then to, to giving that positive reinforcement in a, in an equal measure elsewhere. Well, totally. But you know, it's not oppressive. It's just you, you are older, more experienced, and you know what's best. There's kind of like no question about that. Yeah. So you are the person to speak and set the rules. I mean, I think this is an idea that's not very popular these days. I mean, yeah. we have a hard time telling the difference between authority and authoritarianism. Yeah. Um, and male authority is particularly under siege since, you know, the whole patriarchy thing came into focus. I mean, you can abuse your authority for sure, but that doesn't mean all authority is bad. Yeah. There's a purpose to it. And without it, things fall apart. Or you have alternative authority structures that are become increasingly more bureaucratic and process-based rather than, I guess, personality-based or person, person to person-based and stuff. I, I really think like my kind of tendency at this point in our conversation is to say, you know, there's kind of our tradition, our liberal tradition of always kind of being in revolution, always kind of trying to you know, refine things and topple the regime, topple the regime, topple the regime. Uh, you know, even the American uh, revolution was kind of a daddy issue gone wild. You know, it's like, we're, you're, right. we're no longer your child here. We're, we're our own men. We, we're, we want freedom to be our own kings kind of thing. And so that just, the, the whole process of where men are now, I think, does come from a, a pedigree of trying to escape authority or refine authority and casting authority um, incorrectly as just basically bad or basically oppressive. So I don't think it's oppressive, but I, I see the critique constantly that any sort of authority is oppression. And then what we end up with is a bunch of very weak leaders who are kind of like shadows of leadership. Right. Or, and, not or, and we end up with the destruction of the traditional family. 
where you know, I think of I think of gender ideology and I think of it as a, a state of constant adolescent rebellion that there there is no authority including reality that is going to tell me what's true and if you know if you my father will not validate my internal reality, which I know to be true, then, you know, you have no authority over me anymore. So, you know, yeah. it's, it's been incredibly destructive to healthy authority within the family structure. Um, I, and I think on some level, it must be absolutely terrifying to these kids to feel like they get to say what's true, and there's nobody looking after them and watching out for them. It must mm -hmm. be really scary on some level. Oh, yeah, scary, or it makes them very susceptible to manipulations where they wouldn't ex uh, necessarily accept it, right? They get involved in these online communities, they get love bombed, they're, they're, right. you know, the yeah. seeds of doubt uh, are planted between them and their parents, and then we'll be your family, we'll be your rainbow family, we'll, we'll give you the love and the affirmation. But it's all disapparated and dislocated and, and like it's just like a swarm it's not personal it's it's right. it's all cut up and, and dispersed out there and then if you start to question things you're told not to and then if you really start to question things you're kicked out and then you end up where a lot of these detrans people are where they not only have to come to terms with what they've done via medicine to their bodies but also having to rebuild their whole social structure and their whole world view gee benjamin you're Describing something that sounds an awful lot like a cult. What? Do you like cults? <laughs> Do you collect them? Have you ever no. been in one? No, I haven't. No. Um, Not even real estate? That's not a cult? No. My friend Ben Appel has. Do you know Ben? Yeah, 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 yeah. He's writing a book about it, actually, and the similarities between growing up in a Christian cult and encountering gender ideology. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it... it it does feel to me very cultish and the the challenges of coming out of the cult are you describe them really well first of all you lose your glitter family mm -hmm. um they they turn on you and they revile you and then you have to deal with first of all all those issues that pre-existed your transition that you were in flight from they're still there you still have to grow up and figure out who you are and what you're going to do with your life yeah. and you have to deal with the guilt of what you did to everybody that you care about and and how you might have damaged your body it's like detransitioning is a huge psychological challenge yeah. and so being involved in this so far as you have, um, are there beginning to form standards of care or uh, just kind of like loose, a loose booklet of advice that addresses the particular needs of the detransitioner on all these different fronts that you just mentioned? Well, um, you know, I'm part of GenSpect, Stella's organization, and I'm the clinical lead for our program called Beyond Transition. So that program beyond we... Beyond Transition. It is Beyond Transition. And we called it that because it doesn't mean you've detransitioned necessarily. It just might mean you're in some in-between place and you're questioning gender ideology and you need some help. So we provide a lot of services. One of them is... Um, um, subsidized individual psychotherapy. So we have a, a team of therapists who are willing to take on clients at reduced fees and will subsidize the rest of the fee. So we do that. But we have all sorts of other things that we provide to them. We do, um, there's different kind of peer groups in there, you know, just maybe a therapist guided peer group. Um, we're going to be offering a DBT therapy group in the in the new year. Um, one of the things we're exploring is using Jordan Peterson's self authoring program and doing a workshop with, you know, some of the some of these people together kind of guiding it to help them rebuild their lives. We do like career counseling. Um, there's all sorts of services because these kids really, they have to rebuild their lives entirely. Yeah. Um, they're often very marginal financially because they've kind of left, they've lost everything, right? Um, we just came out with a guide. I don't know if it's online. If it's not online, it will be soon. It's a 
It's a brief guide for therapists working with detransitioners in which we outline some of the particular challenges for this cohort. Some of the things I was just talking about with you, you know, about identity formation and having to rebuild your life and some of the shame and guilt issues you have to deal with. Um, one of the things as I interface with therapists, both through Genspect um, and now at GETA, is there's, there's a big need for, there's a demand from therapists for supervision and help in figuring out how to work with these people. Yeah. So um, we're going to be start offering supervision groups in both organizations. So we're, we're really mobilizing to try and help this group because there's not much out there for them. So what's this identity formation thing? Is this where you like, you get, do you get multiple identities if you get enough? Like if you get progress through this process enough, you get to unlock? I, I don't know. I think of it, I think at some point you, you develop a cohesive singular identity. And I think that's part of adolescence. I mean, you know, uh, what was I? I'm trying to remember what I was trying on for size when I was a teenager. I was trying on that I was, uh, you know, a... Well, I was a pretentious asshole, but what I was trying to be <laughs> was, you know, like, like what type, like an, a, you know, like a, a intellectual, a cultured intellectual okay. who's just a, a sophisticate. I was trying on Are that. You re reading Sartre or what? Um, well, I was, I was reading at that point. What was I reading? I was reading all the classics of the Western canon, yeah. um, becoming, you know, familiar. So I could drop quotations into conversation and make reference to the things I'd been reading. You know, that was, that was cool. That was sophisticated. And then, you know, I kind of outgrew that and I was a writer and, and that's an identity that might, might carry you a certain distance, but it probably won't support you. So then I had to figure out how to earn a living and I became a psychologist and I think I settled into who I am more or less in my mid twenties, yeah. but it was a process of, of, cycling through different possibilities of who I was and how I was going to yeah. express myself. Yeah. And I think that's normal, isn't it? I, don't you think so? Well, I think that your, uh, your explanation of your own identity um, is particular because you're focusing on what you did, right? You eventually became a career. It's like, I, I am somebody who does something. I'm nothing in myself. I'm somebody who can quote, who does know, who can write, who does write, who has books, right. who, who is a psychotherapist, right? Um, so you're kind of using the trade model of self-development. And once you figure out that niche of like what you're doing in the world, then the identity or the self kind of follows and flows through that. Yeah. I wonder if I'm, a, I wonder if that's a more male thing. Yeah. I was going to say, that I don't want to, you know, uh, yeah, I don't want to, not that women anybody. don't do that. Yeah. I don't want to offend anybody either. They, d I think women do that, but I think men do it more, you know, um, in in Carol Carol Hoven's book Testosterone T, um, she talks about there being like a bimodal distribution for masculine and feminine traits, yeah. and it doesn't mean that you know women can't have some of these masculine traits and vice versa, but they they tend to cluster in certain ways, right? Yeah. That's the way I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, it does make sense just off the top of my head, evolutionarily speaking, that if a woman is designed as a woman to produce children and to raise children to be viable reproductive entities, that her value set would be people oriented and male not having that reproductive power would be more like, what can I do in the world? I built this house, I provide for the family or something like that. So right. in order for a man to have meaning, it's more in a support role in a way. In our Western way of thinking, we put the career on top and the family on bottom. But for most of all of human history, the family's on the top and the career is just uh, is right. you know, eccentric or, or circles around the family. But we've kind of mo moved in this other direction that might lead to men not really knowing what their role is because babies are off the table, families are off the table and the values right. around sustaining a long-term partnership are kind of out the table too, which is a huge source of identity. Right. For everybody. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't mean to suggest by emphasizing my career path that it's only about that. And eventually, I mean, I always wanted to have kids. So, you know, I'm a dad. I was a very involved dad. That was a huge part of who I am. Um, 
But um, one of the points that Reeves makes that you were just alluding to is he said, you know, now that men really aren't the breadwinners anymore and they don't have that source of pride and engagement in, you know, supporting and protecting their family, what's, what's the buy-in for them into the family? How do you, how do you tie men into the family if, if there's, what's their role, right? Yeah. So and I think that's the family suffering because of that. Men are suffering, uh, men are suffering because of that. I mean, it's a, it's a bad situation. Anyway. Hmm. Hmm. Poor men. I I feel really bad for men. I do. Yeah. I've been trying. I've been trying for a while to write about this, and I find it really funny that it's you know it's a gay man who's trying to do this. But I um, a few years ago, my agent and I tried to pitch a book um, in New York. You know, and I've published other books. I'm not a stranger to this industry, and it was it was. Um, what was the title? Non-toxic masculinity, why you don't have to become a woman to be a good man. Oh, ouch. Okay. Right on. And the publishing industry he, must have loved that. They, oh, I was, I was rejected <laughs> completely. But the universal comment I got was, you know, this in, this, in this, I'm giving it a condescending tone because it had it. This author needs to recognize that masculinity is purely a social construct and that men can be reprogrammed depending on, you know, what we expect of them. I mean, that was the full belief system. Um, and I was just, no, nobody would go near it. Yeah. You know, three years later, my agent says the climate is changing. There's some, a couple of new conservative imprints that have opened up within the big five. Um, one of them is publishing Ben Appel's book. So I'm working on it, something new. But, but when I first got to Palm Springs and I first joined that center, um, I gave a class um, called um, How to Be a Man When You Don't Like Football. And I was just trying to explore some of these enduring qualities of masculinity yeah. that, that we historically have always associated with men and finding ways to notice them in ourselves, even if we don't like to drink beer and watch football, you know, even if, yeah. and, you know, just to try and help gay men who really feel a lot of shame often about being failed men or outside the hierarchy or the, okay. yeah, they, they just don't fit. Trying to help them to feel good about themselves as men. And I, you know, I really think it's crucial, even for gay men, even for gay men who might be somewhat effeminate. I think you have to make peace with your manhood and to feel, you can't feel good about yourself as an ally of women your whole life. It's huh. not going to do it. Um, huh. So... I want to find ways to make men feel good about themselves. That's so my mission. That, that's what I've been trying to do with the gender thing. It's like, okay, I'm, I want to break the critique and break the stereotype. Like, I, I'm not concerned with the stereotype. Like, the beer-guzzling, football-watching guy is a type of guy. But what you're just saying that you, you gave a hint, like, there's, there's a virtue that manifests whether the man's into this or into designing fashion cardigans right there's still there's a masculinity at work in even effeminate men so what are, what is that what what's operating there what what's something that, that a man needs to feel good about or needs to honor in himself as a man well i'm just I'm, i saw one of your tweets earlier this week in which you named five masculine virtues you know Courage, I, I integrity, will. sacrifice, uh, bravery. I think that's another form of courage. A couple others, yeah. But yeah, I was, yeah, but I, I was railing at these uh, trans rights activists that go up and bully women, and they need to man. Nobody's telling them to man the fuck up because we can't even say that. Man, man right. up! Like, and then the women come in and say, "Why, why, why are you doing that? Man's a man's just a social construct. Like that, you're not supposed to say boys are boys, boys." Blah, 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 blah. So. Meanwhile, they're, they're behaving in stereotypically masculine, toxic masculine yes. ways. You know, like yeah. bullying. Yeah, it's just it's just like a joke yeah. that they identify as women. But you know, um, I think ambition and fortitude hmm. are and and you know, again, I I feel like I always have to issue the disclaimer. This does not mean that women can't have those qualities. But I think for men, they're, they're more central, and they're more central to them, their idea of self. So, um, 
having having a plan, having a, a goal in your career, working towards it, working diligently towards it, being resilient, having fortitude. You know, my one of my sons, who's who's a fashion designer in New York, there we go. gay, not not hyper masculine. He's got he's a really hardworking, and he's really driven in his career. Um, and pursues it with a kind of single mindedness. And he's had lots of setbacks and he gets really upset for about 48 hours. And then he just pulls himself together and he goes on, he regroups. I think that's a great masculine quality and he should feel, and I tell him all the time to feel good about it, right? Yeah. Um, they just, we just need to, men need to be told that they should feel good about things. They should be praised for embodying masculine virtues. We don't do that anymore. I really like ambition. Yeah. I, I think that that is probably one of the most underrated virtues um, that a lot of, I, I see a lot of men are lost because they lack ambition or they don't have ambition or they don't think that they deserve ambition. But finding and cultivating that, wanting to do something in the world, wanting to be the best at something and failing at that, but wanting that, I think that that striving for that is so essential to this thing called meaning is to is to kind of push yourself into the world and see what you're what you're made of. Right. Totally. So I. I I would say that for me, the single most important thing that ever happened to me in terms of consolidating my sense of a man in a positive way is that in 2008, 2009, during the real estate downturn, I nearly lost everything I owned. I almost had to go bankrupt and I was as bad as low as I've ever been. And I will never forget my oldest son telling me that I had to get it back on my feet. You know, stop feeling sorry for yourself. You know, nothing, nothing will motivate you more than having a beloved child tell you <laughs> to stop feeling sorry for yourself. <laughs> so I took his advice, and it was. I started blogging then, and I built up. I got a big following. It got me my first book deal, um, and then I started getting requests for you know, what, what I consider working as a therapist by Skype, because my blog was all about psychotherapy issues. And I opened up my practice and filled up immediately that way. Um, my real estate stuff all turned around and I've been very successful there. So it, I, it's, that, it's that ability to regroup, to show resilience, to continue struggling in the face of adversity. Those are qualities that make me feel good as a man, not as a person, you know? It, Maybe that's wrong, but it's the way I feel. Well, I mean, there's nothing. I think it's okay. <laughs> I think it's okay for men to just have men things. It's fine. It's totally fine. It doesn't take anything away from anybody else for men to have men things. It doesn't. But with that said, what is, in your years of experience in the various forms of psychological help or work that you've done, what is it that men can bring or do bring or can bring or you've brought as a man to that work, to speaking to other men, to even speaking to women? Like what is something that, that a man can generate in, in the psychological workspace? Well, I think as a role model, first of all, um, embodying authority in a positive, helpful way. I mean, okay. like you were talking about your work with kids. You embody authority. You're a role model for how a man in a position of authority can use that authority in a positive way to protect other people and help them. You know, I don't, we don't have that many examples of that and they're not honored if we do. Hmm. Um, what is authority? I, I asked Stella this, and it was interesting to hear her answer. But what is authority within the psychological work relationship? Oh well, it doesn't exist anymore. You know, this is my one of my big beefs is that you know when I started practicing, people came to me as a therapist because they assumed I had wisdom or insight or something that was worth paying for. And that they would listen to me when I spoke, like if I, not in an oracular way, but if I said something, you know, it probably carried weight. And I find the whole erosion of authority has 
permeated my field as well. So that now some teenager can come in and say, you know, I'm, I may have a girl body, but I'm actually a, a, a boy. And if you don't respect that, f- screw you, yeah. you know, where I, I can't just speak about what I know to be true and what I understand it, it, because I, I'm not given that authority anymore. You know, it's a, it's a weird thing. Yeah, our whole society has oppositional defiance disorder. Now. <laughs> totally, totally. You know, we, we're mm. in a state of perpetual adolescent rebellion. Well, so when you're presented by that, are there not ways of outwitting them? I mean, once, once the authority is, is undermined, then you're like, okay, well, now I have to use strategy. Right. And I have my strategies. Um, are they trade secrets? Do, can I have one? I'll be, I'm happy to share them. Um, it's, um, it just, it's just that I, I feel a little bit compromised that I'm not just speaking what I believe to be truth, because I've always thought that's what a therapist does. So the therapist just says what, says what he or she believes to be true. So rather than... So here's an example of something that I have said to a gender client talking about wanting to transition and what it will be. And I'll say in slightly nicer terms, yeah, yeah, you're still going to have to figure out what you're going to do with your life when you're done. I mean, transition doesn't resolve everything for you. How are you going to support yourself? How are you going to spend your life? You know, transition is so often treated as if it's as if it's an accomplishment or an achievement, and then you're done. Well, sorry, you know, I don't have to tackle the gender thing there. I can just say, ah, eh, whatever. You yeah. Know? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, on the other hand, if you push it a little bit further, you would say, well, once you get this taken care of, then you're going to want to do this. And then you're going to want to do this. And believe you me, the medical industry will give you 20 years of surgeries and you will never right. e- reach the end of becoming a woman or becoming a man. There's no end right. to that. Right. And none of those procedures is an achievement. It hasn't resolved anything in your life. It hasn't answered any important life questions like career. How do you, um, I ask my clients all the time, how are you going to support yourself? Have you thought about that? You're like a year away from graduating from high school. You can't wait to get out from under your parents because they're oppressors and don't validate your identity. Okay, great. You're going to be independent and you can take hormones. Then what? You know, just, it's almost like, I feel it's like calling their bluff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, before reality does, I guess. Well, right. Yeah. And they're, yeah, and they're ruined. You know, I see, I I see it on the other end, you know, five, seven years later, when reality calls their bluff. Sad. Well, that's, that's an interesting thing. Uh, working with detransitioners like you want to give them compassion but the role isn't always to be compassionate the role is to be empathetic and to hear and to listen but not to emote and not to cover up their feelings with more reinforcement of your feelings or anything like that it's right in in my work sometimes i i think i do come off as i don't think i ever come off as cold but i'm i cannot reinforce the emotions that are being expressed. I, I, when, when everything's get emotional, I become very quiet. I, I become as invisible as possible and as just attentive as possible because it's to engage with emotion is to not resolve the emotion, but just to amplify the emotion. So, but at the same time, like working through grief or helping people through grief, you have to have a, a, I would suppose that you would have to have your finger on the grief or the finger on the brokenness. And then what do you do typically, or or what have you learned to do when, when helping somebody through regret? Well, well, first of all, you have to be really, you have to be empathic, but don't buy into the victim narrative because, you know, it's easy to fall into the, the medical and mental health professions really screwed me over yeah. and I've been, you know, and, and because I think if you look out in the D trans world, there are a lot of people who have made that that's their identity now, right? They're, they're fighting back against this horrible system that wounded them in a victim kind of way. I worry about them because 
they're still going to have to figure out what they're going to do with the rest of their lives, right? They still yeah. have to find a, a way forward. And but you, you, it's, you just brought up a whole bunch of thoughts for me. Men are criticized for being too stoic. That's the, you know, they're not in touch with their feelings enough. They should be more like women. But I, I think a masculine principle, maybe a fathering, a paternal principle is to is to have some distance from feelings and to say, yes, but, okay, yeah. fine. But, you know, we still have to go out there and the, the, you know, the other tribe is coming to attack us and we still have to go out there and defend ourselves. Yeah. Um, it's a, that's a, that's a good thing um, to be able to do that. I mean, it can become excessive and you can have yeah. no contact with emotion, but. Yeah. Well, the, the emotion becomes like a counselor, somebody that's giving you information. Like it's a messenger. It's like, here, I'm sad or I'm broken or I'm hurt. It's like, okay, yeah, th thanks for that piece of information. I'll incorporate that in how we go forward and make sure that we're going in, in the proper path and rebuilding what was right. destroyed, right? So it, you, yeah. it need, you need some distance, but not detachment from emotions, from pain right. in order to, to act. I've always had a fairly um, high pain tolerance. Really? I don't know. I don't know why, but I have a, I have a really great capacity to, almost to observe my pain at a distance and to regard it as calm, kind of not me. Okay. And it's it's very adaptive in certain ways. It comes in really handy at times yeah. to be able to not just become identified with my pain, um, and kind of taken over by it. Um, I think that's a good thing. Um, I bet a lot of people would think that's a bad thing, hmm. but related, testosterone and estrogen. So one of the things you hear from people who have gone either way is that people who natal female who starts taking testosterone can't cry anymore. Yep. Gets, and is even upset that they can't cry. There's something very important about crying for processing emotions for women. It's actually just exactly. a part of how they process emotions. Exactly. Or men who go on estrogen, they're crying all the time. You know, so there's something, there's something biochemical about it going on. You know, it's just built into us. Um, I just, it's very refreshing to hear you say these things as if it's okay to talk about them. You can say <laughs> crying is an important part of emotional processing for women. I mean... I, I think it's it, it's important for me, but I don't need to do it that much. But I, I just I've noticed, especially for teen girls or girls who go on testosterone early on in life, and getting detached from that like, that valve, and then they're just it seems like the testosterone all also makes them angry and horny. So those are the only two ways that they can to express their emotions. But it's not fulfilling. It's it's it gets really drastic. Some of them even uh, have told me that they can have become quite violent because they don't have access to any other way to externalize and process that. Well, right. I mean, imagine that you're, you've grown up female and you've had this biology and this psychological way of processing emotion, um, but you haven't been exposed to certain kinds of emotion. And then all of a sudden you drop testosterone into the system, which produces a whole set of feelings you're not used to and you're not equipped to process. I mean, wow, what a disaster. Yeah. I mean, it's a wild that ride. was the case. Yeah, that's what happened in our family, you know, with my daughter. Oh, yeah? Um, she had some very serious mental health reactions, rage reactions, roid rage reactions to testosterone, um, and was, you know, violent, emotionally violent, cruel to all of us. You know, I just think hmm. it just brought up all this surge of emotion. She was not able to uh, process she didn't know what to do with it. And that was 10 years ago. So like, may well, I that, ask, is, is she, did she adjust? Is she doing okay? Now? No. She has cut herself off from the entire family. Um, there's a very rare occasional exchange, but we are, um, we have been written off. That happened when she was eight. So eight, maybe like five, six years ago. This is when the testosterone started. And then like maybe two years after that, three years after, she completely got rid of us. So it's been a few years now. I'm sorry to hear that. It's, it, thank you. It's, but, you know, especially now that I'm in this space, it's not an uncommon story, right? 
Yeah. It sounded earlier, just a bit ago, it sounded like you don't think being a victim is good? I, I don't think being a victim is good. No, Why because not? it's di it's disempowering. If you, it, it makes you helpless in the face of, you know, malign influences, whereas opposed, you know, it's not a very resilient place to be in. Yeah, bad things happen to me, and I have to go on anyway, you know? But wh you know? why do you think, well, uh, there's two questions here. Why is it so prevalent? Why does it have cachet now to be a victim? But do you have any thoughts on, like, why human psychology developed that mechanism of victimhood? Like, is it adaptive in a way, or is it malignant? Okay, well, first first question, which my answer won't be any surprise to you, is that you know, we live in a culture in which victimhood is valorized, and you're, everyone's always competing to, to be who, the greater victim, because that's a source of self-esteem, right? I am the greater victim, so I get status, right? Yeah. That, that's not, not a surprise to any of us. Whether or not victim, I don't think victimhood is, is adaptive, but I, I, I can see how it might have a, like a psychological defense component that's helpful. So maybe you feel deeply ashamed and damaged of the whole experience you've been through, but you get this compensatory thing where you get the victim status, which elevates you a little bit. You're not just down there completely shame ridden and feeling awful about yourself you get there's this little plus side yeah does that make sense yeah i'm sorry to bring up curtis yarvin i bring him up too much nowadays because i'm heavily invested in his thought but um one of his uh key uh critiques of american hege he hegemony 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 is that, hegemony, is that we go out there we see an underdog out in the world and we, we help the underdog, which then by overthrowing the regime and then the underdog goes up and then we, we constantly have this cycle where we're going around screwing over everybody that we're trying to help. We empower the underdog. We have this thing where, where we take moral, um, we, we get off on the feeling of, of our own largesse of going out and helping the poor underdog in the world. And geopolitically, it's just led to massive amounts of death and genocide right. and stuff like that. So we've externalized our, uh, you know, helping the victim, wanting the underdog to succeed. And we've, we've internalized it too, where we're doing that to ourselves, where we're kind of our own psyche and our society is eroding for the competition to be the top underdog, right? Right. It's, 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 a, it's pathology. It's a, it's a very appealing narrative. Um, yeah. That there's a that there's an underdog, uh, there's a good guy and a bad guy, right? Yeah. I think it's 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 obviously very simplistic, but yeah. that's it's that's what's attractive about it. Well, we can we can flip that a little bit wordplay wise with, you know, there, there might not be a good guy and a bad guy, but there's a good man and a bad man, right? There, there's good men and bad men, or there's a way to be a good man and there's a way to be a bad man, and to dismiss all masculinity as either good and glorious or bad and detrimental is to to flatten the playing field in a bit and i'm just wondering in the process of identity formation which is kind of a psychological term it sounds like something very similar to let's say what the catholic church has done with instilling virtues in the laity right like this is how to be a human being this is how to be a good person and um, by, you know, having self-control, uh, you know, not doing these actions and doing these other actions. Right? And we've lost, along with losing our authority, we've also lost the ability to tell people what's good and what's bad in a lot of ways. We can't really go around and say, you know, it's not good to do heroin. Like, no, you do you. It's fine. You know, it's if you end up homeless, we'll take care of you or whatever. Um, so I'm wondering, is there any room in the psych? psychology area for saying, you know, you're not, you're not behaving correctly. You're behaving incorrectly that your behavior is causing you and others pain and you need to not do this. It seems like not something that I'd hear in my head, a psychologist say, but something that could lead to better mental health. 
I totally, I totally agree with you. You know, my last book was about shame. And I think you're talking about is there any value to shame? I mean, if people feel do something bad, should they feel ashamed? Um, shame, my, my whole thesis is that if you can pay attention to shame, you could actually learn something about yourself and what you did wrong, and you can grow from it. Yeah. But as a culture, we, we no longer have any room for shame. Um, I used to give the example when people ask me for an example of good shame, I would say, well, do we really want pedophiles not to feel ashamed of their impulses? I mean, isn't shame a deterrent? Well, and now you see what's happening is where they're, they're minor attracted persons. They're no longer pedophiles. They're minor attracted persons, and we're trying. They're trying to destigmatize it. I mean, I do think it's a cultural trend that I mean, all shame is bad. You should never feel bad about anything, and anybody who tries to or inadvertently makes you feel bad is an enemy. I mean, I th do think that's where we are. There isn't a healthy role for saying, you know, that was wrong. You know, that was a mistake. You should not have done that. No, that sounds very fascist to me. It, you, people go around telling other people what to do and what not to do. Like That's just authoritarian. Pa parents as fascists. Yeah, no, it is. <laughs> that's where it's headed. Or it's the expression of legitimate authority. You know, there are people who know better hmm. and people who can guide you. And sometimes they have to reprimand you. Yeah. Yeah. One um, beautiful aspect or theme within the detransition interviews that I've done is uh, like this humility and then this incredible strength that is gifted to people who have been humbled. Um, this, this insight and this authenticity, like the real authenticity, right? There's this odd... Uh, idea that gender affirmation is your authentic self. But what I find is the more I, the more missteps I've made in my life, the more authentic I've become, the more humbled I become, the more I've been able to tell hubris from ambition or, you know, yeah. lust from love, you know, and mm -hmm. it's in, in a certain way of reading what gender ideology promises. It, it promises you this easy access to, actualization and right. and then it, that creates people who haven't gone through adversity or invent incredible adversities like they're being genocided all the time because people aren't you know changing uh, saying the right pronouns you know they the human humans even humans that have been denied adversity create it in order it's like we need some sort of adversity but it's all ego driven it's not really brought down to earth and that's one of the you know in the scars that people get they become more and more real and true i've seen it totally but in my language i mean yes humility but to me you're talking about um shame experiences I don't talk about shame in the way that most people think about it is oh, the John okay. Bradshaw or Brene Brown thing, which is something that comes from outside, like you've been shamed. I think that shame, it's also, it's a bi it's built into us, it's biological, it's there for a reason, and I talk about it a lot in my last book. But one of the ways in which shame comes up is you experience shame in the face of disappointed expectation, which could be disappointed expectation in yourself. And yeah. if you and and that that it'll just produce the shame feeling. And if you yeah. if you ward it off and try and you know deny it or you know defend yourself in some way, you'll never learn anything from that experience. But if you can be humble in those terms and bear with the shame of having failed, um, learn from the experience and then go on, it's a growth experience, right? It, it's it's defending constantly okay. against shame that stops people from growing. Okay, I, I wanna I want to pull this word out a little bit, like unfold the word growth, growing. What what does that mean in your terms? What is it to grow as a person? I know it's a metaphor, I just want to hear a little bit more articulation in that. I think, uh, healthy at any size kind of growth? Is that what you're talking about? Um uh, <laughs> I mean you know knowing yourself as best 
you can, as fully as you can. I mean, I think we, we know ourselves, but what's that quote from Lear? He has but ever known himself slightly. I think that's true of most people. They don't know themselves very well. Hmm. So growth to me is about is about knowing yourself well, learning to embrace the full range of your experience, all of your emotions to be able to feel them, but not but and to be able to think in the presence of feeling to be able to manage yourself in that way. I had a teacher who used to said that the goal of psychoanalysis was to teach people to feel deeply and think clearly. Oh. And that's the idea of that to me is the self actualized person in touch with her emotions, able to feel them but not be overwhelmed by them and continue to think clearly in the presence of them. Yeah. And your pra like where where's your practice kind of headed? Do, does does do you just like get clients, or are you focusing? I guess you're kind of focusing more and more on gender. Is that kind of like where you're you're headed? Is that how like one guides the ship of their career in your career? It's it's I, I, it feels like it's just sort of happened. I didn't really I cho I chose to get involved in the gender space because I felt I needed to do something, and I felt like I brought some skills to bear and some personal experience to bear and as it's evolved over the course of the last year i've gone from you know just sort of fielding consultations with parents working with some adolescents to now m most of my practice is boys and men um pre-transition but a lot of them detransitioned and i i work i'm my main clinical interest right now is autogynephilia Hmm. I have I have five oh. AGP guys in my okay. practice right now. Um, what are you learning I'm about fascinated that? By yeah, what, what is that about from your perspective? Well, it's 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 weird to have an opinion in this space because Ray Blanchard and Mike Bailey and Ann Lawrence um, and Ken Zucker they all think differently from me, um, and I think it's I think it's just because they're not they're not psychotherapists they're not psychodynamic psychotherapists so they don't take a developmental view, so I'm working with these guys. I haven't seen a single one of them that felt good about being a man who didn't feel like damaged as a man on some level, who had poor models of manhood. I mean, to me, all this focus on on the fetish aspects of it, I think is misguided. I think of it more as like a drug, that it's um, it's something that you can do. I mean, jerking off feels good. Right, it just does something you can give yourself to feel better when at base you feel like shit about yeah. yourself, yeah. and so it's it's in. I think I've told you the expression: it's impoverished manhood, impaired manhood, something there, um, and you can see how it just dovetails with all of my ongoing interests. It's funny how it just sort of worked out that way. So um, you're of the mind that it's a developmental or an adaptation to psychological circumstances, not just uh, like, it's not the same as being gay or straight. It's not a wiring thing, if that's the correct phrase. You know, you know Anne Lawrence talks about the faulty target identification yeah, that yeah, she yeah. sees it, she sees it as a wiring thing. You know, it's still early days. These people have way more experience than I do, so I'm trying to speak with humility here. Um, <laughs> but, but so far, what I'm seeing is, you know, there, there always, there consistently is a developmental accounting. Okay. You know, it's not like these guys had great relationships with their dads, and they grew up feeling good about the men in their lives, and then this thing just showed up out of nowhere. No, that is not the case. So. I'm just exploring. I'm not quite ready to write about it yet, but I will yeah. be. Um, I, I think it's interesting. There's something about male sexuality, especially in the gender conversation, uh, from the point of view that I'm in or the connections that I've made, which is mostly kind of women and feminists, where male sexuality is not really given uh, an objective view uh, point or, or even uh, terribly much sympathy or compassion because it's kind of seen as a danger no matter what a man does with his dick it's a danger right in in a certain mm -hmm. way which is really real and i can see why people would think that because dicks have consequences um and the bodies that uh surround the dick are pretty forceful um and stuff but in 
considering or speaking to male sexuality, what's, what are good, healthy frames for that, um, that we can kind of give men an island to express and explore and think deeper and act clearer with regard to their sex? And we can use autogynophilia or any other modality of, uh, you know, to explore this question. Right. Well, you, I'm, uh, you know, we've read the same stuff. I mean, men evolution-wise are, are programmed to have sex with a lot of different women in order to increase their chances of leaving offspring behind. That's built into us. Um, I don't th think that just condemning men for being that way has been very helpful. You know, moralizing about it. You know, we can't help being wired the way we are. Um, I think that if you're going to ask men to suppress or curtail that impulse, there has to be something in it for them. Oh, okay. there has to be a, a reward. Huh. Like, what's the what's the compensation for giving up this impulse I have to have sex with a lot of people and just stay with one person? What's in it for me? Um, and I think historically we have found ways to make men feel good about being fathers, heads of the family, protectors, you know, reinforce their other virtues. And um, nowadays, I don't know. I'm not sure that they're, I can see as from a certain male perspective, it's like, why? Why shouldn't I just fuck around? Well, why, why shouldn't they just fuck around? I think that's a viable choice. Really? I mean, you end you end up lonely if you're thinking about the long range picture when your libido might be lower and your social needs are higher. You know, you might want to invest in a long term partner so you don't end up alone. Yeah. I mean, there there are, are other compensations. Yeah. But you know, it's interesting in in the gay community where different standards apply and there's there's a greater understanding of male sexuality because we're all male. There's all sorts of arrangements to allow for this. You know, I know many people who are married and have been committed together. And when they're apart from one another, it's acknowledged that you get to do what you want. Don't fall in love with somebody else, but I understand your sexuality because it's like mine. So go ahead. You know, yeah. I, I've known many straight men who are very envious of gay men. <laughs> I'll leave myself out of this. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, sex pretty much on demand is, is the male dream, right? Just to be able to have sex with whoever you want, whenever you want. It's, you know, and that's, a, you know, it isn't like that everywhere in the gay community, but a lot of that's kind of true. Yeah. Is there, is there negative consequences to that in the gay community? And do you think that the gay community having been accepted and uh, just no longer as persecuted or made illegal or whatever um, has matured into something that's hidden and, and just a lot of just messy relationships. And uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't mean to project any kind of heteronormative stereotypical yeah. views in the gay community. Keep, keep your cis heteronormative <laughs> shit to yourself, Benjamin. <laughs> um, I haven't seen any change. Seems to me pretty much the same. Hmm. Um, you know, the gay community can also be kind of immature in that way. You know, there a lot of us are still, you know, acting like we're in our 20s and having lots of sexual partners and focusing heavily on remaining sexually attractive and fit, to, you know, as, you know, yeah. We have a hard time giving that up. Was what was the relationship between your sexuality and your masculinity, especially when you were uh, a teenager? Like, if you were coming of age today, would you be more inclined to go the trans way? Or? Yes, I think I would have. And you know, when I when I got into therapy when I was nineteen. I was pretty depressed and I went into therapy and I had, I remember some sessions having conversations about f wishing I had been born a, a woman, you know, really feeling it. Cause I felt like a failed boy at that time. Right. I felt like I just really didn't measure up at all. Um, and I thought I would have made a better girl than a boy. And, you know, thank God it was then and not now. And I'm very grateful to have had a therapist who was able to look in to it with me without 
you know, having any preconceptions. And what became clear to me um, pretty quickly was that I was really frightened by the prospect of adulthood and having to move into a, a male role as an adult to earn my living, all of those things that come with adulthood for boys and girls, but that I had this fantasy that you, if you're a woman, you didn't have to do that. If you're a woman, you got married, somebody took care of you, it was all just done for you. It was this privileged, you know, it was like Earth, Eartha Kitt singing Santa Baby, you know, like, <laughs> I just want... I, that's what it was like. He disabused me of that notion and I got over it. Um, what's interesting is that I think when I was married to my wife and it was a young father, I think I was still more female identified. I think I was being more motherly to my children as a young father. Yeah. Um, and I became, I think I became more paternal as I got older. And and after I divorced and ended up with my husband and went through all this real estate stuff, I, I strangely, I feel more masculine now than I did married to a woman. You know, it's, huh. it hasn't, has nothing to do with heterosexuality for me. Yeah. Was the, was that dynamic? Like she became more masculine? Was it like, or was it like a hyper feminine household because both mother and father were kind of, well, you know, people, People who know my my ex-wife often, people who didn't know her well, let's say, but met her, often wondered if she was a lesbian. She's very masculine and identified. She's a very strong, very powerful personality. Yeah. So I, I would think there was a little bit of gender reversal in our marriage. Yeah. Um, yeah. Huh. And I became more masculine when I was out of that marriage. Yeah. Yeah, there was more Go room figure. for more room for you to pee on things and <laughs> go around. Like well, and I I had to, you know, it was it was kind of um, I don't I don't want to use melodramatic terms, but it's kind of like life or death for me. I had to figure out how to be a man to make peace with my life and to feel to come to the end of my life and feel good about it. Um, yeah. You know. It was, it was really tormenting to me during that time when I was doing badly. The thought that I might die and that my sons would think of me as a failure. I mean, oh my God, it was like torture wow. and, and very motivating because I wanted to present, I mean, I, for me also, but I wanted to present an example to them of hard work, resilience, recovery from setbacks, going on to be successful. Yeah. So I feel really great about that. And it feels like a very fatherly thing to do. So earlier in the conversation, you said that transitioning is not an accomplishment, like becoming a woman, if you're a boy, becoming a woman is not an accomplishment. But if, but at the same time, and there's, the, there's just some nuance here, you're also saying that becoming a man, if you're a boy, becoming a man is an accomplishment. It, it, I would, the distinction I would make is that, you know, donning the accoutrements of femininity and dressing as if you were a woman and learning certain mannerisms and lowering your voice and that's not the same thing as you know embodying the feminine principle and and becoming a mother or becoming you know an accomplished woman it's just it's excuse me it's just uh, it's a facade it's aesthetics okay you know um, and which is why feminists get so enraged with, you know, these men who think that they're women just because they're embodying some idea of what a woman is in their head. Yeah. You yeah. Know? yeah. I get they're, it. They're treating women like what women treated womanhood maybe when they were 13. It's like, okay, I have to act like a woman now or whatever, right. you know, and reducing it to right. that. Yeah. So through the looking glass of, of, of gender as a man becoming a man what what is that again i guess we, we've covered this over and over again but what does that kind of mean what does it mean to be a man i i to me it means um making contact with these enduring masculine virtues that have been celebrated throughout millennia um, in various forms and figuring out how to embody them yourself I mean, figuring out how they organize your life and explain your experience. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
I mean, it just, it just feels crucial to me. We have to find a way to help men feel good, to know what being a man is and to feel good about being a man, as opposed to constantly telling men that masculinity is toxic and they ought to be more like women. It's just been a disaster for men. Yeah, they, they end up acting like failed men act, like losers, um, basically, acting out, self-pity, victimization. Right. T totally. What, sometimes I ask in this class, I ask people like what, you know, what they think are their best qualities um, and what, you know, what they like most about themselves. And the one I can't stand, and I always tell them that they can't use, they have to think of something else is, I think I'm a nice person. Oh. It's like, uh, what, what is that? It's like an interesting yeah, person, but for people-pleasing purposes. It, it's very much a people pleasing purpose. Yeah. yeah. And I did it just, it, I find it at this point, I find it really annoying. <laughs> like, no, sorry. That's the wrong answer. Come up with another Wait, are you, one. are you a uh, agreeableness shaming? If it's fake. <laughs> yeah. If it's phony, if it's just people pleasing and an impression management. Yeah. What, what's I'm impression getting, management? This sounds like I'm trying to, I'm trying to, appear in a certain way so that you will have an impression of me as a good person who holds the yeah. right values and has the right set of feelings. Yeah. Yeah. I'm disdainful of that. Hmm. Were you always, or is this a new development? No, I've always been pretty much the same way. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not, I'm not disagreeable in the way that Corinna Cohn says she's disagreeable, but I've always been, I, I keep it well hidden. I've always been a little bit snarky about that kind of thing. I don't like niceness. Huh. But you live in Palm Springs. It's not a nice place. It's not a nice place. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to my life, Benjamin. Yeah. It's so, there's so many layers to it. It's an onion. I'm a misfit. <laughs> So you, you said uh, before you went into the psychology profession that you were a writer, were you doing like crazy, like detective novels or what? Well, my, I wrote my first novel when right after I finished UCLA and I sold my first novel when I was 22 years old. Oh, good and for it was, you. It's a science fantasy novel. Science um, fantasy? Science fantasy, which I've now gone back to writing, but I'll tell you about that in a minute. But okay. I, my first novel was a, was a fantasy adventure story. And I made twenty five hundred dollars nice. on it, I think. Yeah. Um, and and then my agent got me a, like a writing for hire, like a novelization. After that, um, it was it was I was had the script and I turned it into a novel. And the movie was released as um, Night Warning. This would have been in the late maybe early eighties. Christy Krista. Christy McNeil, one of the McNichols, Jimmy McNichols, Susan, Su Suzanne Terrell. Anyway, it was a slasher thriller. And it was called Night Warning when they released it. But in the middle, they had decided it was going to be called Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker. Oh. So I have the horrible shame of having my name on a book called Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker, <laughs> which I always disown. Like Goodreads wrote, contacted me and said, is this book your book you wanted associated with the other child? And I said, no, no, I did not write that book. It's not mine. <laughs> it's uh it was pretty embarrassing um so then for a long time there was nothing and there was graduate school and becoming a psychologist and building a practice and having a young family yeah and then i sold my first nonfiction book to um a specialty publisher in psychology um and I had a contract, had an advance and was working with them. And I, I withdrew from the contract because they wanted me to make it more like CBT. And I'm, you know, a, I'm a psychoanalyst and I, I couldn't make the changes they wanted. So I, um, I canceled the contract, gave them back their money and self published in 2012. And it was the smartest thing I, I've ever done. Benjamin, I oh. make, I make about $25,000 a year on royalties on that book. Oh, just a year. Year after year, just on that one book. What's it called? Yeah. It's called um, Why Do I Do That? Oh. Psychological Defense Mechanisms and the Hidden Ways They Shape Our Lives. Nice. Yeah. You did it. it. 
I did it. I was it was really really cool. That was part of the recovery from failure um, section of my life. Then um, my agent sold my book um, on narcissism. It's called The Narcissist You Know, and that came out. It was released by an imprint of Simon and Schuster. That was 2015. And then, is, is there a picture of a man looking into a beer on the cover? No, it's it's like a, it's a very clever background. It's like all of the background text is me, 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 oh, me, nice. me, me. Um, it's it's a beautiful cover. Um, and then uh, uh, Saint Martin's Press, or um, yeah, Saint Martin's Press picked up um, my next book, which was which was it's just about shame, and it was called Shame, and it had this beautiful but terrifying cover. It's it's bright yellow, and all of these arrows are pointing towards the letters M-E in the word shame. Huh. Oh, so yeah, 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 yeah. it was kind of scary. Cool. And it, it, um, it sold so well that they, they agreed to let me buy it back from them um, after a year, and they, they declined to bring out a paperback edition. So I re-released that book under my own imprint, um, and that's doing okay. And then um, I've gone back to fantasy fiction, and I've, I'm writing a, a, a series, an epic series, um, destined to become an HBO miniseries. Um, and the main, one of the main characters is a character that is a mutant that periodically switches back and forth between genders, between okay. sexes, which allows me to explore... Ooh, um, all these issues, yeah. but all of these, all of there was a plague that left all these genetic mutations in the culture, and all of the mutations are psychological in nature. So there's one character that's what we would call a charismatic narcissist, and he he is immortal because people keep falling in love with him, and then they die as he drains away their love yeah. into his own life force. So they're all things like that. Um, yeah, it's, it's all psychological. Yeah, like a menagerie of psychological forms. Right. So that so I finished the first one and I released it on my own and I had a company in Somerset who, um, they're great. They did the audiobook recording. I forgot to mention that in there, I also did a collection of three psychological fairy tales retelling. They're like novella length, each one of them, called Grimm. And it's, so it's, it's Cinderella, um, Snow White, and Rapunzel. So Snow White is about shame and self-injury, in my terms. Um, <sighs> Snow White is about antisocial personality disorder and Rapunzel is about borderline personality disorder, but they all have to do with shame and defenses against shame. And they're, that's my favorite thing that I've ever written is my book, the fairy tale book. Oh, wow. Yeah. I love don't, fairy tales. don't cut this part out. No, no, this is, this is in the recording. <laughs> I will, I'll link to your hub of authorship. Uh, I guess it's usually called a website. Maybe we're, yeah. Everybody, yeah, we're okay. my blog after psychotherapy where I've been blogging for years, there's a, you know, there's a scroll, there's a thing at the top that scrolls through my titles and okay. links to order. So you've gone from after psychology to beyond transition. You're, you're really kind of like flirting with the postmodernist kind of naming convention. Well, I, that was, I didn't choose that title. That was Stella decided to use that title. Stella and Alistair picked that title. I know, and I, I think just, that was, I, I, yeah. yeah, I think it was the right title because we're not saying detransition because it's more than just detransitioning, right? It's all these other things. Um, yeah. And I think that all of this experience is ultimately going to allow me to write that masculinity book that a publisher will actually want. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think that I think, all, the, I think that there's a uh, there's there's growing hunger for good media, right? Because the official sources of media are not producing anything other than crap. I mean, it's right, woke totally. crap, but it's still crap, which means it's crappy crap um, from the totally. point of view. So there there is a market for good stuff and for you know uh, action heroes again, maybe a good totally. You know, the, the hard thing is for 
maybe it's for someone who's a lot younger than I, maybe it's not the case, but growing up with my reverence for, for literary authors, you know, the imprimatur of New York publishing is still, you still want it, right? Yeah. You want that stamp of approval. Yeah. Um, so even though I make more money self-publishing, I still want, I, I, I want a big, yeah. I want prestige, and I, w I would like once to have a book, like a publisher get behind a book and make it, you know, put some resources to promoting it. You know, I had to do everything on even on my big five books, too. They didn't do anything, or hardly anything. Yeah. Well, you got you to gotta do uh, some spicy tweets like Jordan Peterson. A little bit more uh, ranting I, I, on social media. That, that'll I'm terrible. I'm terrible at that. You know, I'm terrible at social media. I don't, you said I don't know. That you I had see, an inner snark to you. Just bring it. Let it. I, let it out. I don't. I don't know that I want to do that. Okay. I mean, there are people. There are people who I watch. Uh, you know, I'm on Twitter a lot because it's where I figure out what to read. You know, and you know what's important to know about. But yeah. there are people who are really good at it uh, in formulating things that you know. Maybe it's something that I already know. They're not saying anything new, but they manage to put it together in a way and get get a lot of engagement. And I just I feel like I'm terrible at that, okay. and I'm just going to accept that I have some skills and not others. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. That's humble. You can yeah. grow as a person, but you don't have to cover the whole world with your growth. I, I don't. I don't. <laughs> like like Eliza. Mondegreen. Recently, yeah. Mondegreen recently come on. She's so good at it. You know, I've just yeah. watched her. She's she's really good at it. Um, and I just, I, I just, I, I, I just read them. I think no, I, I just can't do this. You know, I okay. don't have that gene. That's it's fine. all right. Okay. But I can write good books, and I'm a good therapist. There we go. Are you are you accepting clients? <laughs> um, I'm pretty. Is full. there a process for that? Do people have to apply and get like three references from like two no, advisors? No, it's not or like, like that? I get an email. Like, show me inbox. your pain before I'm gonna. Uh, spend my time on you i'm pretty full right now i really don't have i i have like maybe an hour or two i could take on somebody new wow. and what i'm really interested in working I'm, I'm interested in working with the boys yeah. and understanding what's driving transition and understanding autogynophilia better i mean i'm just really compelled by those topics yeah i th there's more stories of uh, agp or autogynophilia uh out there um and more research and to, that can be done and and just more sharing of those stories for other men who are afflicted by the same kind of distress to like oh say yeah. okay i'm not alone and there's not only one way to work this out which is right. you know, irrevocable uh drugs and I, ha I have to say in my in all my experience i've never seen a more tor tormented group of people than the autogynophiles. It's torture. Um, this sort of compulsive sexuality that leaves you with a feeling of self-loathing afterwards and the feeling you can't get out of it. I mean, it's really terrible. Yeah. Joe. Have we come to an end? That was a great great chat um last thing do you have a like a fancy thing that you do that isn't like writing and doing all this stuff like real estate moguling and and saving people from psychological distress and writing awesome books do you have like something just banal and cute that you uh i like studied jazz piano oh really who are you joe play? burgo like <laughs> you, you get your fingers in all the pies man um I, I studied classical piano most of my adult life, um, and I started studying jazz seriously about two years ago. My teacher's in London, and I meet with him by by Zoom, and it's it's an incredibly lengthy, challenging, humbling, humbling experience. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not very good at it. When did you pick it up? I started studying jazz like... Well, three years ago, I had a terrible teacher for one year who taught me nothing, and then I found a good teacher, and I've been with him for two full years now. Uh, so you just noodle twenty minutes a day when you have to. It's it's at least an hour a day, and it's it's it, he's got a whole method. It's there's a whole technique to learning. It's not. I always thought it was just sort of like either you've got that improvisation gene yeah. or you don't, and it turns out not to be true. 
Um, there's actually a way to learn it, but it's very, it's very time consuming. You have to learn, you have to learn you know, all these scales, all these progressions, chord progressions. You have to get it into your hands so it's second nature before you can really begin to do any of the other stuff. It's just, it takes a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Deferred gratification. I'm yeah. good at that. Really? Yeah. I'm good at working for years before the reward. Oh, that's another masculine virtue or a virtue that men could uh, embrace a little bit more. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, I really appreciate this talk because, and it was just exactly like I hoped it would be. It was just, I could just say to you whatever I wanted. There we go. Um, we'll worry about what, the consequences later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I feel like I'm in a position where, you know, what are they going to do? They're going to come after my license or hmm. people are going to write me mean emails. I don't know. I don't know. They can take all your property. I mean, if they're in league with the federal government. Yeah. No. Not going to happen. I'm not worried about that. Oh, cool. You're a confident man. I'm going to end the recording. Thank you so much for your time, Joe. Thank you, Benjamin. I really appreciate it. I've been looking forward to it. Boom. Good.